Hey, good morning, everybody. How you all doing? Good. Good. I got a thumbs up. That's wonderful. Hey, I just want to let you know, if you're, uh, if you're chilly in here, we have some uh, blankets in the back. They're right by the doors in the back there. If you'd like to have a blanket, if you're a little chilly. All right. And then let's start with some music.
open with a word of prayer. This prayer is from the song Jubilate Deo, uh, and I just want to read some of the lyrics as a prayer. Raise a song of gladness, peoples of the earth. Christ has come, bringing peace and joy to every heart. Alleluia, alleluia, joy to every heart. Alleluia, alleluia, joy to every heart. Amen. And now our call to worship. We gather to worship God, God who makes bones dance, God who calls Lazarus from the grave, God who forgives us and gives us hope. Let's stand and sing hymn number 15, Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers.
And now call to our confession. If the Lord marked our iniquities, we could not stand. But there is forgiveness with God. In trust and faith, let us offer our confessions to God. Let's offer these all together. Out of the depths we cry to you, O Lord. Hear our voices and let your ears be attentive to the voice of our supplications. We come into your presence confessing our sins. Aware we have behaved in ways that are contrary to your desire for our living. We come into your presence aware that too often we allow lifelessness to gain the upper hand. We come into your presence aware that we put our trust in our own abilities. Forgive us, O oh God. Infuse us with your life-giving spirit. Breathe into us and make us come alive. Let's continue in silent personal confession. now our assurance of forgiveness um, together uh, well I'll, I'll call you respond hope in the Lord with the Lord there is steadfast love with God there is great power to redeem thanks be to God who redeems us from all our iniquities and now I'd like to gather the kids together Rocco and Vito I'll come to you. <clears throat> hey, boys. Do you know what the word compassion means? No? You want to take a guess? Do you think you might be able to guess, Rocco? No. All right, let me tell you. Compassion is loving people who are around you, no matter what you might think of them. Have you ever tried to love someone that was hard to love before? Yeah? How'd that work out? I'm getting a thumbs up in case you don't see. It worked out just great. <laughs> oh, oh, half, half maybe. Well, one thing about compassion is it starts with knowing someone. What do you think is a good way to get to know someone you don't know? What do you think? Like, what's one way? You know it's someone's birthday who's not here? They're not here. Well, hey, Jesus tells us that one way to get to know people is just to listen to them. Just to listen to their story, hear about who they are, maybe even ask some questions. And so that's one way that we can get to know Jesus is by listening to people's stories, okay? All right. All right, you all can uh, wander off to uh, your, your kids' time. Okay? Oh, we might. Karen, I think they're staying. They're going to figure it out. <laughs> And now for the passing and the peace, wherever you may find yourself today, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always, and also with you. To those at home, peace be with you. We love you so much, and show each other signs of peace. Peace be with you. Peace. Peace. All right, our first reading today is a short one. It's from the book of Micah, and it's uh, chapter 6, verse 8. Sorry, I didn't have it pulled up here. Give me one 
a second. What's that? Oh, it's on the screen, too. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I'm still getting used to the technological world today. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I like to go to the book, but all right, here it is. It's uh, verse 8. It says, He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading today is Matthew 25. At first, I was going to do the entire chapter, but I'm just going to hone in on the end. So verses 31 through 46. The beginning is really wonderful. It's two more parables that are just really lovely and help to really understand the kingdom of God. Please, at your leisure, read them sometime. But here's what we're going to hear today from Jesus. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. 
I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and, and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have to say, uh, I, I, I don't usually puff up a sermon, but this is probably the best I have to offer. If I could read this sermon every week, you'd, you'd probably get a little bored, but I would probably do it if I could. This final portrayal of the judgment is one of the most important pieces of Matthew's gospel. It clearly defines the blueprint that Jesus has for how we are judged and how we are meant to live. But it brings with it some surprising elements. It shows us a clear picture of who we're meant to be as faithful servants of God. And this agricultural metaphor tells us what faith truly is, how it is acted out, and who can be amongst the faithful. And it's surprising what transpires. I want to tell you just a quick story first. There was a man, Christopher Searcy, who was playing basketball with his friends on May 16, 1998, when he was shot in the chest, and the bullet perforated his aorta. His friends helped him to get within 40 feet of the entrance to Ravenswood Hospital, and then they ran inside and asked for help. But the hospital staff had to refuse to help Christopher, saying that it was against the hospital's policy to administer aid to those outside of the hospital. They couldn't go, the policy said no. Eventually, a policeman was able to get a wheelchair and bring him into the hospital where he could receive care. Unfortunately, by that time, it was too late. Christopher died about an hour later. What is faith? It's a hope in God's promises and a belief in the unseen, invisible, spiritual world of God. It's a belief in a promise that you'll enter the kingdom of God. If you heard my devotional back on Thursday, Hebrews 11, Paul says it all. He says, faith is a hope when we might have nothing to hope for. It's a belief in something that can't be seen. It's an obedience to this book, the Bible. Even when we have questions, even when there are mysteries... We believe. We have faith. It's like the reverse of Abraham, who God said was blessed to be a blessing. We're a blessing because we think we might be blessed. It's faith. What does our faith look like? That's the core of this scripture today. <clears throat> have you seen the least of these and felt a need to take care of them? Have you fed the least of these? Have you given them something to drink? Have you welcomed a stranger into your home and maybe even into your life? Have you seen someone naked and left alone to the elements and clothed them? Have you taken care of the sick? Have you visited the prisoner? Jesus's final judgment isn't what you know or who you know. It's not what scripture you have memorized. It's not even do you label yourself a Christian. His final judgment is plainly, were you compassionate? Were you empathetic? 
as Presbyterians, we might be hoping for a quiz in the end. Like, if I can answer as many questions about the Bible, and then I'm in. Or maybe here at St. James, it would be like a singing contest. If I could sing really well, and then I'm in. It's all good, right? Maybe just name the 12 disciples. If you can name the 12 disciples, you're in. But that's not what it is. In the end, the only thing Jesus seems to care about the only thing that matters when he's in judgment is this question. Were you compassionate? What does faith look like? Active faith. It looks like taking care of those who are in need. It looks like equality and a fair share for everyone. It looks like teaching people how to fish. Like Mr. Rogers said, true love begins with listening. Henry Nouwen, an acclaimed Christian writer, says this. When we honestly ask ourselves which person in our lives means the most to us, we often find that it is those who, instead of giving advice, solutions, or cures, have chosen rather to share our pain and touch our wounds with warm and tender hands. The friend who can be silent with us in a moment of despair and confusion who can stay with us in an hour of grief or bereavement, who can tolerate not knowing, not curing, not healing, and face, us, uh, faith with, face with us the reality of our powerlessness. That is a friend who has compassion. Jesus asks us that question. Were you there for others in their moment of need? I always think of my good friend, and mentor, Professor Pendleton. He's a Catholic priest and Christian counselor and professor. He said the first time he dealt with grief as a priest, he had no idea what to do. A young family had just lost their daughter, and so he went to their house to try and grieve with them. But he said he sat there feeling incredibly awkward and, and almost like panicky because he didn't know what to say. He had lots of scripture memorized. He's like, what scripture will help in this moment? And he couldn't think of one. And so he sat there in silence. And he kept going back to their house, trying to be a good priest and have a word for them. But every time he went to their house, he had nothing to say. He had nothing to offer. He would just sit there silently. If they were crying, he was crying. If they were talking, he would just listen. But he said nothing. He says, afterwards, a few months, the family moved away, but he continued to think about that great failure. He, he thought it was a personal failure, that he never had anything encouraging to say. A few years went by, and he received a letter from the family, and it said this. It said, we didn't have the words back then, but we just wanted to thank you so much for coming and being with us, sharing our pain and grief. Your presence in our home was so powerful, and it helped us to heal. And he was like, wait, what? You know, all this time thinking that was a mistake, that he should have had something to say. And actually, just his presence there was very powerful for that family and helped them to heal. He did, in his mind, nothing, but he was doing the work of compassion. Compassion doesn't always mean big, bold acts. Compassion isn't even something we could actually measure. You can't measure compassion. But it's what's on the scales of justice for Jesus. It's that crossroads of justice and mercy and faith. Compassion. Do we have it for our brothers and sisters? So then that's what faith looks like in the world. But who is the faithful? I have to say, this is a place where the Presbyterian core and I tend not to agree. As Presbyterians, we tend to be Calvinist. And what that means is we follow our good friend and brother, John Calvin, who says that faith is a chosen thing, that God chooses specific people who will have faith, and then there's people who don't have faith. And that's a selected thing that God does in his own way. God sets apart a book. A group, rather. It's interesting that this scripture, which only appears in the book of Matthew, 
which is a book for Jewish people. The book of Matthew was really directed to the Israelite people who also think that there's a set apart group, an elect, that they're the chosen of God. Yet this piece of scripture is telling us so much about who has the opportunity to be accepted into the kingdom. The piece of scripture begins this way. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. This is the same thing we hear about in the beginning of Revelation, where John sees the throne of glory. And all people from all tribes and all uh, places of the world come together to gather around ju God for judgment. At no point does it say the Israelites gathered or the 12 tribes of Jacob gathered or even Christians gathered or even maybe believers in Jesus gathered. No, it says everyone. It says everyone gathered. And then Jesus said some will be sheep and some will be goats. There isn't a select group here. It's everyone. Everyone is invited. I also want you to note that both of the groups, once they're divided, are surprised by where they end up. They didn't even realize that they were going to be sheep or they were going to be goats. They say, Jesus, when did we do all these things that you're saying that we did? They're shocked. They didn't know. One of my favorite wrestlers in, uh, in professional wrestling, not the real stuff, the, the fake stuff, his name his name is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Maybe you've heard of him. He's pretty popular in the world. He used to do this skit before he would have a match where an interviewer would come up and they'd say, well, Rock, you know, um, do you think you're going to be able to beat maybe like Hulk Hogan or something? Do you think you could beat Hulk Hogan? And then they'd put the microphone to The Rock. And The Rock would like think. He'd have all these funny facial expressions, be thinking about it. And then he's like, well, what do you think? Do you think I could beat him? So then the interviewer would kind of pause for a minute and kind of be thinking, and he'd be about to say something, and The Rock would grab the microphone back, and he said, it doesn't matter what you think. And that would be his skit. He would always do this the interview. It doesn't matter. And then he'd go in this tirade of how, of course, he's going to beat the person he's going to fight. Well, Jesus is doing something very similar. This whole, the last few chapters as we've built up and Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and talking to the disciples and talking to all these people, he's doing the same thing that the rock does. He's like, well, what do you think? Do you think you're going to be able to sit on a throne next to me? Or do you think you might be one of the greatest? Or do you think you're doing the right thing? And just about as they're about to speak, he goes, it doesn't matter what you think. Let me tell you exactly how it works. You're sheep, you're goats. And that's how he divides things up. He says, you over here, you did what I asked you to do. You did the compassionate work. You're over here now. You did not do that work. You're over here. And then he's very plain about what's going to happen next when it comes to whether or not you're going to enter the kingdom of God. If you smell what Jesus is cooking. And yeah, okay, all right, a couple people. All right, yes. It's interesting to know that whether you're a Bible expert or a person who reads the Bible every day, or if you're just an occasional reader of the Bible, or if you've never opened up this book before, everyone is surprised by the way Jesus does judgment. No one saw this coming. Matter of fact, we've all come, come up with ways of dividing people up into groups, but we find that Jesus' division is totally different than ours. Noted Matthew scholar Jose Pagola says this. Jesus does not distinguish between chosen people and pagan people. He says nothing about all the different religions and cults of his time. He talks about something very human. He talks about something that everyone can understand. He says there are people who are suffering. And you're going to have to choose if you're compassionate or you're not going to be compassionate. If you have soft, tender hearts, or if your hearts are made of stone. He says that's the only division that's going to happen here. He goes on to say that people from every race and nation, from every culture and religion, are gathered. And only two groups emerge from the gathering. Those who have compassion and those who are indifferent. 
And you see, we create lots of dividing lines, right? Male, female, people of color, white people, heterosexual, homosexual, liberal, conservative, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, voodoo, Baptist, Presbyterian, Anglican, Catholic. We create all these dividing lines. You're not in our group. You're not in our group. You're not in our group. We make them, and Jesus says, none of that matters. Those don't matter to Jesus. None of them do. Let me say it again. We create dividing lines, all sorts of different groups. We've created so many different ones, and lo and behold, Jesus doesn't care about that. He does not care about our distinctions about people. This is like final judgment for dummies. You remember those yellow books? Final judgment for dummies. You open the page and all it says is compassionate, not compassionate. That's all that's in the book. During last year, I uh, talked about the Matthew 25 church. Our, our denomination, the PCUSA, has created this initiative called the Matthew 25 church. And it breaks up this blueprint that Jesus has laid out. And it says we're going to work on three things. They're actually adding some more cool things to it. But in the beginning, they had these three things. The first thing that they cared about was just to make sure that your church, our church, was a vital part of the community. What are we doing specifically to make sure our church is a need in the community? The way we have connected with New Hope Ministries, with Bridge of Hope, Bethesda Mobile Mission, these are ways in which we become vital. But Matthew 25 suggests here there's more we can do. There's more we can do to become a vital part of the community. The second one is working to eliminate poverty in the world. Again, some of our partnerships are helping with that. Some of the things we've been doing recently have helped with that. But Matthew 25 is going to suggest there's more that we can do. The third one is to end systemic racism in the world today. This isn't something we've actively been a part of, but we've been reading some things. We've been learning some things. We've been trying to discuss what our role could be. And Matthew 25 is going to suggest this should be something that draws our focus. These are three ways we can show compassion to our community as the church, as St. James. There are many other ways. And so what I want us to do is this. I just want us to think about what tugs on our compassionate heartstrings. What topics really tug on us? Maybe it's the war in Ukraine. Maybe it's uh, the way indigenous people are treated in our country. Maybe it's um, financial hardship, economic gap issues. Maybe it could be uh, even not human related. Maybe it's something about the world. Maybe it's about um, pollution or things like that. Or maybe it's about animals, endangered species. Whatever it is that tugs on your heartstring, I just want you to think about that. And I want you to pray about it. And then maybe there's something we should get involved in to do something to help in those areas. Every time we think about where our compassion drives us, that could be a focus of our church. I want to give you this final word. I'm hoping you've heard this sermon and something's sinking in and you might be thinking, dang, I have not been that compassionate recently. Or maybe I haven't been listening to too many stories recently to try and hear how to, to love people that are around. Maybe there are times where I felt compassionate, but right now it's a little dried up. Maybe there are some groups that my heart is soft towards, and there are other groups that my heart is hard towards. Maybe I've had compassion, but now it's kind of dissipated. There's a thing called compassion fatigue, where really you've been helping people and helping people and helping people, and you're out of the energy to do that. And that all makes sense. Like, that's actually, it's okay. It's okay to feel depleted. It's okay to feel dried up. But if you're feeling that way, I want you to take a step back and draw a breath and pray for God to ignite you in a new way. I want really God to help us to be faithful to his blueprint for compassion to other people. Sometimes churches draw inwards for a period, 
right? And really, the focus is how to better us inside, this, the church St. James, how to make us better. And I think this past year has, has been a lot of that. And I want to say, that's okay. Sometimes churches need that work, that internal healing work. It's hard to heal people on the outside if you're not healed on the inside, right? And so if that's where we are, that's okay. But I want us to begin a journey this year of seeing where compassion might take us. What things we might get involved in with compassion. Because this is what Jesus is saying here, right? We all probably have an image of what entry into heaven is like. And, and I'm going to describe it. You can nod your head if you've heard this before. But there's a shiny, pearly gate. And there's like a courtroom stand and Peter's there, right? And Peter has a book. It's not this book, but I'm just going to use this for example. If you heard this book. And he's looking at the book of your life, right? And he goes, oh, well... On February 15th, 1987, you had a lustful thought about someone. Not sure if you're going to get in. Oh, and over here on June 5th, you swore at someone who drove faster than you on the highway. I don't know. Is that, have you had that impression that that's what the entry to heaven might be like? If you've had that impression, I want to tell you, it's actually more like how the Grinch stole Christmas. It's actually more like a person who's really messed up on the inside, really broken, and pretty much hates everything. It looks, oh, I hate Christmas. I hate Christmas lights. I hate Christmas songs. I hate all this stuff. And through a story of life with Jesus and other people with Jesus, all of a sudden, that person who was kind of like a curmudgeon, I don't like anything, their hearts have transformed. They've become larger, and all of a sudden they're right there singing the Christmas songs. That's what life with Jesus is actually like. It's a life of asking him to soften our hearts, asking him to transform our hearts so that we can love all people. There's a time for your heart to be softened, and there's time for us to choose compassion, even if that hasn't been our choice in the past. It's, there's a time for us to listen to stories, to hear the stories of those who are suffering and be moved to compassion. There's so much out there for us to do, and we're not alone to do it. Jesus died because the world remained unfair. The world remained uncompassionate. It's still that way today. The world remains unjust. The world remains xenophobic and racist and hurtful and violent. And that's what Jesus died for. He died because the world couldn't change. Never forget that God put his stamp on you. He blessed you with his image. He made promises to you, directly to each of you. He's still listening to you. He wants your heart to be softened, but he gave up his son so that you could be made clean, pure, and unforgiven. He sent the Holy Spirit to give us the power to change, the power to remember compassion, the power to act from the merciful faith that's in our hearts, the power to drop all of our judgments so that we can let our heart grow three times bigger. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I firmly believe that in this piece of scripture, we've been given a blueprint, a manual, a plan, a way to live our lives. And if we're beginning to live our lives that way, that's great. But if we're not, Lord, you came for us. You desired us. You died for us. And you ultimately forgave us. So, Lord... I ask that today as we go through this day and as we uh, begin to walk into the spring of this year, that cold hearts are melted and compassion wins, Lord, because that, that is the desire you have for your people here on earth. Lord, there's just two groups of people in the end, those who had compassion and those who were indifferent. Help us. 
us to be sheep, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing hymn number 407, When a Poor One. Let's now give our affirmation of faith. This is an excerpt from a declaration of faith. Jesus announced the coming of God's kingdom and its presence amid the world's kingdoms. He taught his disciples to seek God's kingdom first. We believe Christ gives us and demands of us lives in pilgrimage toward God's kingdom. Like Christ, we may enjoy on our journey all that sustains life and makes it pleasant and beautiful. No more than Christ are we spared the darkness, ambiguity, and threat of life in the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. 
Dear our confidence and hope for ourselves and other people do not rest in the powers and achievements of this world, but in the coming and hidden presence of God's kingdom. Christ calls each of us to a life appropriate to that kingdom, to serve as he has served us, to take up our cross, foreseeing the consequences of faithful discipleship, to walk by faith, not by sight, to hope for what we have not seen. I'm going to pray over our offering today. Good and gracious God, may these gifts be one of the ways your life-giving presence is experienced in our community. Please use all our resources and use us to give hope to the hopeless, wholeness to the broken, and fullness to the hungry. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing the doxology. bow our heads in prayer. God of valley and grave, we come before you today and pray for your life-giving presence in places that seem dry and dead. There are those places we know from the news, Ukraine, Turkey, Syria, Greece, East Palestine, <laughs> Russia, <clears throat> places where war, disaster, and human greed have led dead bodies and broken lives behind. In the book of Ezekiel, it says, Mortal, can these bones live? Oh God, and for the people in these places where they have had to bury ones they love, even as they worry about their own living, give them breath that indeed they may live. Across your created world, your people wait and hope. We wait for an end to violence. <clears throat> we wait for an end to racial injustice. We wait for an end to the priority of money over people. We wait for an end to all those things that rob your people of life, that rob your people of breath, that rob your people of wholeness. And we hope, we hope for the promise of the morning, the time when a new light will break on the horizon, hinting at the glory of your presence in our midst. We hope for the promise of the resurrection, of the life that is ours, even when we don't see it fully. We pray specifically for the needs of this community, for people who need shelter, people who struggle to pay rent, people whose incomes can't stretch to contain inflation. We pray for our youth. We pray that young people are seeking you out and finding you. Lift up our youth, Ainsley and Josh Euler, Nina Hainer, Michaela Faley, Rilo Nachman, Grace and Hannah Hoffman, Padraig O'Neill. We lift up our friends who are in need right now. Specifically, we lift up Matthew Bear, Angelo Stone, Jan Whitehurst, Devin Winder, Joyce, Dick, and Evelyn, and others. We lift up all those who are traveling right now. Lord, we uh, lift up all of those who we don't know that are struggling, and we're not sure what's going on in their lives. Lord, we lift up for People we think don't have information about, Lord, we know you know their lives. Space for silence for anyone here in the congregation to voice others we like to pray for. Lord, even in our silence, we lift up those who are on our hearts today, and we pray in the way that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom.
kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> well, it is my distinct pleasure today to be able to ordain and install some new officers. As you might remember from our congregational meeting, um, we elected uh, three new elders, Sarah Saturno, Wendy Jones, and Greg Zorb. And we elected um, three new deacons, Julie Duke, Nancy Geisel, and Randy Winter. They're not all here with us today, so we're going to have like a multi-part. It's going to be like a, a bunch of cliffhangers and, and new starts. When people are here, we're going to install them, okay? As, as they're here. So today we have with us uh, Sarah Saturno, who's going to be one of our new elders. And so I'm going to have her come up first and uh, install and ordain her. And then I'll have Julie uh, Duke and Nancy Geisel come up as our deacons. All right. Could you come up? Yeah, no pressure. All right. This is Sarah's first time being an elder, so we're going to ordain her first and then install her. Uh, so I'm going to start with a prayer. <clears throat> Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Beloved in Christ, in ap apostolic times there were elders to whom are entrusted the oversight and leadership of Christian churches and concerning whom the Apostle Paul advised that they that ruled well should be counted worthy of double honor. Therefore, this church has from the beginning included in her government not only ministers and pastors who are to preach the gospel and administer the sacraments, but also ruling elders <clears throat> chosen by the people to re represent them and to be joined with pastors and ministers in the exercise of government and discipline in the church. These ruling elders in each congregation, together with the pastor, constitute the session to whom it is committed to admit and exclude members, and to supervise the worship, provide for the teaching, direct the activities, and promote the spiritual interests of the church. The congregation of this church, in the mode most approved and in use in this congregation, have elected Sarah Saturno to the office of ruling elder, and they have signified their willingness to serve. We do now, in the name of Lord Jesus, proceed to their ordination. For as much as you have declared your willingness to take this office upon you, I now require you to answer the following questions appointed by the church to be put to those who are to be ordained as elders. The typical response is, I do. I feel like we've been here before. <laughs> it's a little different. <laughs> okay. Do you believe the scriptures of the Old Testament and New Testaments as originally given to be the inerrant word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt? She said, I do. You don't have a microphone. Sorry. For, for those watching. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith and the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures and you further promise that if any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the fundamentals of this system, you will on your own initiative make known to your session to change which has taken place in your views since the assumption of the ordination vow. I do. Do you approve of the form of government and discipline of the PCUSA in conformity with the general principles of biblical polity? I do. Very good. Do you accept the office of ruling elder in this church and promise faithfully to perform all the duties thereof and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your life? I do. Wonderful. I'm just noticing these are different questions than the one we... This, this book has different questions. It's, it's interesting. Um, do you promise to strive for purity, peace, unity, and edification of the church? Wonderful. And then to the church, you all have a question to answer as well. 
Do you, the members of this church, acknowledge and receive this sister as a ruling elder? And you promise to yield her all that honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which her office, according to the word of God and the constitution of this church, entitles her. Wonderful. That's wonderful. All right, let us pray. O oh, eternal and ever... Oh, oh no, this is where the elders come up. And you have to kneel. Can you kneel? Uh, anyone who has been an elder before, which is probably almost everyone in this room, uh, please come up and uh, lay hands on Sarah. Let's pray. O eternal and ever blessed God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who of thine infinite mercy has chosen to thyself a church, which you has, have ever ruled by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, and yet you've used the service of brothers and sisters, as in preaching the word and ministering the sacraments, also guiding our flock and providing for the poor, we commend unto you those whom we now ordained the office of the eldership. Set apart, O Lord, these servants to the work they have been called to by the voice of the church. Imbue them plenteously with heavenly wisdom. Grant them grace that they may be good and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, ruling in the fear of God. Give them favor and influence with people which come from following Christ. Fill them with your spirit, that, they may, that she may lead this congregation in your service. Make them faithful, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, <clears throat> may they receive a crown of glory that never goes away. Amen. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming up. And Sarah Saturno. I now pronounce and declare that you have been regularly elected, ordained, and installed as ruling elder in this church, agreeable to the word of God, according to our constitution, and that you are entitled to all encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, I'm not going to give this charge. I'm just going to charge you to do the very best that you can stir things up a little bit, cause trouble, um, and have fun. Good trouble. Good trouble. <laughs> Only the best trouble. Thank you so much. You give her a round of applause. Thanks so much. <clears throat> and then Julie, I'm going to have you come up first, and then Nancy in one minute. Julie Duke is also, this is a first time for her to be a deacon, and so I will first be ordaining her. And then Nancy will come up and we'll install the both of you. Julie, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. That's from James chapter 1 verse 27. Beloved in Christ, in the Christian churches of apostolic times, there were deacons whose office was held in honor and who were highly esteemed for their services to the church in the company with the elders. From early days, it was a peculiar, peculiar part of the duties of these office bearers to be instruments of the church's compassion. This church, therefore, has recognized the office and work of the deacon as in accord with apostolic practice. In the course of time, new forms of work have been given to this office, as you got the lengthy document that said that. Um, and it has grown to value to the church, while has, there has always been attached to ancient character as a representative of the church's purpose to follow Christ in compassion and ministry to the bodily needs of all people. So Julie Duke here present, having been chosen in the mode most approved and in use in this congregation, having been elected to the office of deacon, and have signified their willingness to serve, we do now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
proceed to your ordination. For as much as you've declared your willingness to take this office upon you, I'm now going to have Nancy come up as well and answer set questions for the installation. All right. Do you both believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as originally given to be the inerrant word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the confessions of faith and catechisms of the church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? And do you further promise that if any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the fundamentals of this system of doctrine, you on your own initiative make known to your session the change which has taken place since the assumption of the ordination vow? I do. Nice. Do you approve of the four? Form of government and discipline of the PCUSA in conformity with the general principles of biblical polity. I do. Do you accept the office of deacon and promise to faithfully perform all the duties thereof and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn that profession of the gospel in your life? I do. Great. Uh, do you promise to strive for the purity, peace, unity, and edification of the church? Wonderful. And then do you, uh, no, the church. <laughs> do you, the members of this church, acknowledge and receive these sisters as deacons, and you promise to yield to them all honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which their office, according to the word of God and the constitution of this church, entitles them? Yes. Wonderful. Let us pray. Let's see. Uh, if anyone's a deacon, we could come and lay hands on these deacons. No? Oh, we're, we're good. We're good. So, no, sorry. Huh? Oh, everyone. Everyone can come up. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Please do. Would you both mind uh, if... No, they don't. No, that's <laughs> let's not do that. All right. Let us pray. Oh Lord Jesus, <clears throat> who did come not to be ministered unto, but to minister, who for our sakes became poor, that we through your providence might be rich, who did love the church and give yourself up for it. Set apart and consecrate these servants to the office of deacon. Give them your spirit of compassion for human needs. Inspire them with devotion to the church. Guide and sustain them in all their service until their work on earth is finished. And bestow upon them the great rewards of heaven, the heavenly kingdom. Amen. Thank you all. Oh, uh, Nancy and Julie, just one second. <laughs> Nancy? Sorry. <laughs> I have to pronounce it. <laughs> I now pronounce and declare that Nancy Geisel and Julie Duke have regularly elected, ordained, and installed as deacons in this church, agreeable to the word of God and according to our Constitution and that as such, they are entitled to all encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I charge you in the name of Lord Jesus to be faithful to this office, and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and abide with you always. Thank you so much. Julie and Nancy, our new deacons. <laughs> you may be seated. And now let's stand and sing our final hymn for today, Crown Him with Many Crowns, hymn number 151.
see you then. Well, we have a few announcements for this morning. Um, if, if you, uh, just a reminder, there is a New Hope Easter meal food drive that's happening right on the side wall as you exit on the right. Uh, it's called Look What We Can Do Together. Um, and so we're going to be collecting that until March 30th. So this is the last week of collections for that donation. Um, also super excited for a second Easter egg hunt, which will be on Saturday, April 8th. That's the, the day before Easter at 10 a.m. Um, I do think there's some opportunities to sign up on the poster that's outside by the table. Um, we will be doing a spring cleanup April 22nd. That's a little ways down the road, but not too far away. So from 8 a.m. to noon on April 22nd, a Saturday, we'll be having that spring cleanup. Everyone's welcome to participate. Um, and then you might have noticed a smaller sign out by the table as well. Uh, Jane is asking for a, a collection of um, the containers that hold wet wipes, you know, the kind of cylindrical containers like the Clorox bleach wipes, those kind. Um, so if you have any, uh, it will help with a, uh, a project that the preschool is working on. Um, and then, oh, I just wanted to also just remind us that um, our one great hour of sharing uh, collection is happening on Easter uh, Sunday. Um, if you don't know a lot about one great hour of sharing, they're focused on three, um, three nonprofits that uh, are very helpful in the world today. Um, one of those is Disaster Relief, uh, the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Program is one of them. And then Presbyterian Hunger Program, PHP, is another. And then the third one is uh, the Self-Development of People Project. And so that's, um, they're partnered nationally with <clears throat> places that help with rent and food assistance. Um, uh, I think if you, if you were to look, well, I think on the brochure it says, it has a, uh, a website for it. But basically helping with the development of people and all of these uh, programs, all three of them are both national and international. So they have some uh, work that they do in the country here and then some work outside of the country. Um, if you want any more information, I'm going to leave this on the table. This is the magazine that comes every every year. So there's a lot of information in there. <clears throat> and we'll do that collection on Easter Sunday. Any other announcements from anybody? Anything else? Uh, college uh, care. Yeah, so we have the college care containers that are going to go out. Excuse me one minute. Sorry. <coughs> and those are out there and ready to go. And there's some cards there. So if you want to sign a card to any of our college kids, those will be going out later this week. Any other announcements? All right, before I lose my voice, I'm going to give a benediction, and it, it's, it is this. Listen for the voice of God calling to you. Mortal can these bones live, and in confidence answer, O Lord God, you know. And then hold on, because God just may use you to make it happen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and surround you today and all days. And all God's children say, Amen.